All right. What did we learn yesterday? Let's see. We learned generating uh, I would say now. Generating an HTML. Yeah. What what uh what process did we use? Or tell me a little bit more about why we generated that HTML. We needed that to, I guess, bridge the I guess for lack of a better phrase, like the icon for the seats. Yep. To show up because if we didn't generate it, it'll just show like object object when we did this. Exactly. Side. So we had to incorporate that so it so it appears. Yeah, the generate HTML, at the end of the day, it's just a string, right? It's nothing special to the JavaScript. It's just, all right, this is something that says span inside of it. But basically what we did is we kind of wrote our first algorithm, right? We said, hey, given this data that has all of the seat information in it, whether it's occupied, where that seat exists, all of that kind of stuff, take that seat information and generate out the HTML to reflect the data that's in our JavaScript. And once that HTML is generated, let's make sure that we generate it for each seat and then for each row. And once we get all of that generated, then we can use that inner HTML uh, with the get element by ID, bridge our JavaScript to our, our HTML using the uh, DOM, the document object model as a bridge and then dump that in. And at that moment, JavaScript is like, all right, I'm giving you the string, I give up. Uh, th this is it, HTML web browser, go do your thing. And that's when the HTML looks at that string and goes, oh, there's HTML in here. I know how to show HTML. And it goes in and it drops all of that information into the page for us. What else did we learn yesterday? Uh, we made our own arrays, but like, we uh, implemented dry, so we didn't have to have a lot of ugly lines of code. Yep. So dry, don't repeat yourself. We started uh, implementing um, some functions to make it um, make our code more reusable, um, and we will be certainly continuing that tonight. What else did we do? Uh, we applied CSS styles using the nth, um, the nth element child. To, to target, you know, certain seats. Yep. And that's kind of uh, CSS level 200, right? So we're starting to say, all right, not only do we need uh, classes or IDs in order to modify our CSS, we're able to use what's called that pseudo selector to refine what we're targeting and say, hey, we want this CSS to apply to the third child or the third element uh, in the list instead of having to put a specific ID on that one. Anything else from yesterday? Any questions? Any code that you reviewed where you're like, not really sure I'm getting it? Um, any free code camp homework assignments that you wouldn't want that you would like to go over? Any of that? I would like a review about that third parent or third child. Sure. Let me pull that code up. Thank you. Excuse me. So um, in our CS, in our HTML, we had eight chairs, right? And there are literally eight spans back to back to back. But in our style.css, what we were able to do is say, look at the material symbols outlined, okay? That's pretty easy. We see that class on everything. And go grab the third child from this list of all the span tags. So what we did is we said, go grab the third one, because confusingly enough, CSS does not zero index. So the first item is number one. So we say, grab the third one, and then we put a comma and say, also go grab the seventh one. And for the third one and the seventh one, we want to add 20 pixels to the left of it. That means if we take a look in our browser, 
we grab not the first one, not the second one, like you think we would. We grab the third one here. And then to the left of the third one, we add that 20 pixels of padding. Mm -hmm. Same for over here. We say ignore the fourth, fifth, and sixth one. But when you get to the seventh one, add 20 pixels over to the left of it. Now, we could have said grab the second one and the sixth one and add 20 pixels to the right of it, and it would have achieved that same goal. Okay, thank you. And we can even tell that that's happening because if we go into the inspect tab and hover over our third child, we can see right here our nth child three has that margin of 20 pixels on it. But if we go to the fourth one, you'll notice that is not included there. That's because the browser is saying, hey, only the third one and the seventh one get the 20 pixels. But this third one matches. So that's why this is in white and this is in gray. But if we go down to the seventh one, you can see that one will now light up in white. OK. Any other questions from yesterday? I have a question regarding local and global scopes. So sure. I understand that a variable inside a function that's defined with const or let is local because you can only use it inside the function. So right. a variable outside the function without const or let, is that global? Any variable, even with a const or let, if it is outside of all functions, it is considered to be a global variable. So even if I say const my var here and say five, that is global, meaning I can do a console log in here of my var and I would be able to get it because scope always trickles out, right? So because I because this is defined in a scope outside of the function, I'm able to use it inside the function. The same is true down here because it is a global scope, I have access to it out here. So even though const is used, it is still in global scope because it is not inside of a function. And if you don't put const or let there and just my var equals five, is that also global? It is also global, although this is not encouraged. It is encouraged that whenever you define a new variable, you declare it using const or let. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Not to say it won't work, and um, you can also just say, you know, you could use a var um, and, and use that, but um, constant letter, the preferred uh, ways of declaring variables now. Yeah, FCC said always declare it. It's a no-no yes. if you don't. Yes. And if you put JavaScript in a certain mode, uh, if you put it in strict mode, it will actually error out and say this is, has not been declared, so you can't use this variable yet. Anything else that we want to review before we dive into code tonight? Okay, so we are actually going to do a review of all of the code that we did tonight because oftentimes as a developer, we, um, we think we're done for the day, we clock out, we go, all right, we've got more work to do tomorrow. Um, and then we come in the next day and it's like, oh God, who wrote all this code? And the answer is usually, well, you did, but we've got that whole day of time that has elapsed, right? Before, uh, since we've we've div we've dove into this code. So oftentimes when we get started fresh for a new day, it's very helpful to do just a review of the code that we're at. So I like starting in my HTML. Actually, before we even start in the HTML, I like starting in my web browser. I like saying, okay, what did we accomplish? What is the end user looking at? All right, we put an H1 in, we've got a P tag, we've got this drop down. This drop down, we did some JavaScript on, we'll come back to that. Okay, now I've got all of my seats and I've got my screen showing up here. Okay, let me make sure that I'm refreshed on my HTML. So I go over to my HTML. I say, oh, right, we had to pull in that CSS from the Google Fonts API to get our material symbols working. I had to put in my own style sheet. Let's take a quick look at my style sheet. My style sheet uh, just centered everything. 
We added some uh, margin on the left to get the, the spacing in the aisle. We did some styling on the screen. We used our inline block. So we were able to use width, but still have the text align applied to it. And we added this class called occupied that turned the seat red. Okay, well, that's pretty good. We come back over here. We've got our user interface that we start building out in our body. We've got our H1 tag. We've got our P tag. We said select and we loaded in all of our movies. Then we also had an empty option here to say, hey, when the page first loads, start out with nothing selected. Start out with that empty option. Then we came down and we said, hey, I've got my div ID seats. We put that ID in there so our JavaScript has something to target to dump the new seats into. Then we put in a div. That div is serving as our row, and we put in our eight different chairs. Then we came down to the bottom, we threw our screen div in, which of course had all of the styling coming from our CSS here. And then we finally said, hey, also include our script.js. Do we have any questions from the HTML or the CSS before we dive into the fun part? Karen, go ahead. I apologize if you probably already um, covered this, but when I was going to um, your HTML, when I click on the seats that are um, available, um, I, I noticed that I, I'm not able to, I apologize if you went over this already, like I said, <laughs> I noticed that if I click on an available seat, which is you know the black seat, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not able to unclick them. So, it so we, adds. we we haven't even done any clicking of seats. So if I click a movie and click on any of the seats, nothing happens. Okay. So okay. You, so I'm I'm too, I'm 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 too you far jumped ahead. not only to yesterday's code, you jumped all the way to the final code. Okay. So that's something that you got to be careful of. Because the the uh, link that I put in the outlines, I'm glad uh, you brought this up. If I jump to the outline, um, I link to the movie app. But you notice here it doesn't say movie app part one or part two. It just says movie app. Right. And this link in here is all of the final code. So there is a bunch of code in here that is not included in in the code that we've done so far. Okay. This is kind of the final thing that we're shooting for. Okay. So the version of the code that we have completed is actually in, if we go to the uh, CIC live stream in Slack, okay. um, as of last night at 832, mm -hmm. this is the code that we have done so far. Okay. So this is a better starting point for today if you are not caught up with where we where we left off last night. I see. Okay. Thank you. And we will be covering clicking on the chairs and generating out the text and all of that stuff today. Okay. Any other questions on the HTML side of things before we do a quick review of the JavaScript side? <clears throat> okay. So we come over here, start at the very top of the file. Movie data. Movie data starts out as a big object. And in that object, we chose a value because they're key value pairs. We want to store the information about the movie. But based off of the information about the movie, we want to store some data about the movie as well. So we store the Godfather as the key, but there are multiple pieces of information about the movie that we need to keep track of. So we created another new object and we use the key of price and a number value of eight. Then we know that the seats are different for each movie. Every movie is going to have a different array of seats. So we looked at the seats and we went, well, seats are not only arranged in rows, they're also arranged in columns. So basically, we said every array in here is going to represent a column of seats. Meanwhile, each one of these outer arrays is going to represent a row. So in other words, all of these seats are what makes up 
the second row of seats. This is the first column, second column, third column, all the way down. Any questions on data structure of why we structured it the way we did? Or does anyone have a suggestion for a different data structure of how they would have done it? Could we have done something like one occupied true with the seat numbers that would have been true and the seat another occupied with seat numbers that would have been false? So we could. Um, the problem with that is that we then need to loop through all of them. So I think what you're saying is something like um, we could say const something like, um, you know, C 1A is uh, not, not occupied. So it would be false, right? And then C 2A uh, is occupied. So it would be true. So we could go through. Uh, uh, we could do something like con seat status e status equals. We could do something like that. The problem what happens, though, is when we need to loop over all of them, arrays are much easier to loop over than objects are. And even when we loop over the object, what happens when we accidentally put something out of order here? We say something like 4C is false. Well, now when we're looping over this object, we have 4C out of place. Mm -hmm. So that's why we prefer to use the arrays down here, because we know the array is in order. So what we're going to be able to do is actually use a multi-dimensional array um, using two indexes back to back to specify not only the row number, but also the column number. And we're going to see that a little bit later tonight when we handle the clicked on seats. Hmm. Okay, I can understand that. So yes, we definitely could do it this way. However, it's just going to make a little more work for us when we're generating out the HTML. Hmm. Okay. Hey, now that I think about it, I'm realizing I don't understand why we have a second array. Why is that there again? Uh, this array or this array? Uh, the the first one bracket. or the second one, the yellow brackets. So the yeah. yellow brackets is representing a an entire row across of seats. So we don't mm -hmm. want 16 seats all the way across. We want eight seats and then another row of eight seats, right? Uh, yeah. And so what we're doing basically is by putting this second array in, we're specifying this is one column all the way across of seats. And then the other one is just another column. This is saying this is the other column, and all yeah. of this represents the rows of seats. Yes. Okay. 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 Anything I, else? I actually have a question, Max. Shoot. Um, so the movie data, since it's a whole, it's a list of movies. My instinct would have been to make it an array. I see the benefit of making it objects because then you have the title of each one acting as the identifier. Um, Correct. So what Doug is saying is, could we have done something like make movie data and an array because it's a list of movies, then make every movie inside of it be something like an object that has a title of the movie? So theoretically, we could do this, but when we try to get out a specific movie, we are trying to access it based off of the title of the movie. So if we put in another movie down here um, and say the the title um, is uh, The Little Mermaid. When we are trying to access the data about The Godfather, we now can't say movie data, The Godfather, like we did down here. We instead need to use the index of the movie zero. Now, that's going to get really, uh, really problematic when the select that we generated up here is using the title of the movie. 
So oftentimes when we know how we are going to access the data is based off of one particular attribute, it's more efficient to, instead of storing everything in an array, store everything in a object. And based off of that object, we are able to use the specific key that we're going to be retrieving the data using instead. So we can get right in to the data that we want to access. Did that answer your question, Doc? It did. Thank you. Because otherwise, you you have to like loop through the array to find the one you're looking for. Correct. Yeah, I was going to say, I was thinking like, you know, and I'm sure it, it does still have more steps, but if you were to do it the way Doug did it, like if you just added an if statement to check to see if the movie title matches whatever the selected from the select was, then yep. you would just go to show those seats in that. But that is definitely like another step. So I see, yep. I see what you mean. Yeah, we could do. And if this is going over anyone's head, that's OK. Um, the, the way we would do it is we would say like con selected movie is equal to uh, uh, let's make it a let and then we could say something I'm just going to say like price uh, 10 to give an example there and then we would say for let movie of movie data and then we would say if the movie dot title equals and we'll say the little mermaid then set the selected movie equal to the current movie and then down here we could do something like console dot log selected movie dot price and if we look at that in our browser we should be able to see 10 from the little mermaid coming out and there are some functions built right into javascript to actually be able to do that a little fit more efficiently uh, we can actually do it almost all in one line. We can say let selected e movie equal movie data dot find um, the movie where the movie dot title equals the Little Mermaid. And that is a function built directly into JavaScript that would also give us this 10 out here. And if we change that to the Godfather, we can see it still works and gives us. Yeah, I think it's one word, Godfather. Yes, it is. That gives us the eight of the price that we set before. So this is a good example of no matter what data structure it is, we can implement that data structure and work with it. But when we know the key that we're going to be retrieving frequently, um, and and that's the one that we're basing all the data around. It's much better to do it as an object. Could you scroll back up, Max? Sure. On your script, JS? Yep. Okay, so my question is, um, the values for the godfather, is it? No, 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 no. This is just so an example added... of the array. This is not the final data uh -huh. structure that we're going to be using. Okay, never mind. So here, let me put it back to what we are using. I just wanted to show examples of there are multiple ways of working with that data. Um, and based off of the data structure, we can always work with it if we don't have control over it to represent the data that we need to get out of it. OK. That is the data structure that we settled on last night. So based off of that, Schneider, do you have a question? Yeah. So um, the godfather is considered a key, right? Correct. And, this, and the vows for that, is that the price seats? The value for the godfather is an object. That object has two additional keys in it, price and seats. Gotcha. Okay. So all the this entire object is the value for the key of Godfather. Yeah, Inside okay. that okay. object, we nest in a level deeper and have price as one key and seats as the other. The value of the key price is the value eight, 
the value of the key seats is this entire array in here. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so let's just finish up this review down here. We did a console log just to prove that we can access different information. This console log is saying, go get the Godfather movie, access the seats array inside of it, then go to the first index. That means that it is the second row because we are zero indexing, and then go get the fourth index worth of seats. So that's really the fifth seat, one, two, three, four, and five. That means that when we get the occupied, we nest one level deeper, deeper into that occupied true. And when we take a look at our console, we get that true logging out. And if we change that to false and save and go back to the console, we see false coming out instead. This is just showing that we can nest in one, two, three, four, five layers deep into our data. Okay, then we came in and we said, all right, where's all of this JavaScript magic happening? This is happening whenever the movie selector changes. Based off of that change, go get the event when the change happens, get the target that the event happened on and retrieve the value out from the movie. Based off of that, we want to go up to our movie data, our mega object up here, and using the value of the option dropdown, use that to get the seats out and store it in a variable called selected movie seats. That means whenever we use selected movie seats, we are accessing this array right in here based off of whatever movie got selected. Okay, so we come down here and we say for const row of selected movie seats. But before we do that, we start this variable called select uh, generated HTML. That's an empty string. That's nothing special. We could have called that whatever variable we wanted. We could have called that unicorns to make, and that still would have worked as long as we were consistent and using it every place you see generated HTML would have to be set to unicorns to make. From there, we said, okay, go over each row of seats. And every time you hit a new row of seats, put in a div tag. That is representing this div tag that you see right here. Then it says, for every time that you get a new row of seats, go over each go over each seat of the row. Basically, get each column of the seats going across. Then we say, is the seat occupied? Well, where is that occupied coming from? That's coming from right here. The first seat is occupied. The second seat is not occupied. This entire object is what is get set into this seat right here. So we say, if the seat is occupied, then add some generated HTML using the class occupied. That is the span tag that we see right here. If the seat is not occupied, then go to that generated HTML and just put out a regular chair. Finally, once we are done generating all of the seats for this row, go down to the generated HTML and add the closing div tag to match the opening div tag. That is this closing div tag right here. Then we hit this curly brace and we say, okay, we go back up to this for loop and we realize there is another row of seats. So what we do is we go back through, we generate out a second div tag. That's this div tag here. We generate all the spans out. We put our closing div in. We hit this curly brace, go back up here and say, there are no more rows worth of seats. So we come down, we console log out our generated HTML. And when we do that, we're able to see in our JavaScript, the opening div tag. And if I can find it, the closing div tag of the first row, it's in there somewhere. And then we see another opening div tag and the closing div tag, right? That's representing everything, all the, the seats that we're generating out. Finally, we take that generated HTML, use the get element by ID seats to reach into our JavaScript 
take all that generated HTML and set it out over here. Okay. That was a lot. Let's take a moment, refresh here. Is there any code anywhere in here that you do not understand or want me to re-explain? Yes. Um, where was it? So I just want to review the event target value. The event is a click. Correct. Click. The target is what was clicked on. Okay. And the value is stored from inside the target based off of what option was selected. Hey, I thought we had to define a click or whatever. We did it on change instead of on click. Uh, okay. Okay. The event, somebody selects it. Target is what they select. The value is whatever data is associated with that movie. Correct. Well, it's whatever the data associated with whatever option they picked here. So the target of the event is actually the select, but then the value is based off of whatever option they picked here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Why above do we have true or false for the seats? We don't up here. We don't necessarily know right now that they are or are not occupied. Is that just we we start out by saying some of them are occupied, just so we can test that feature to make sure the red is showing up. Okay, so what would it look like for real? It would all be black. And so it would all be false in the code until other. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Now, normally, if you think about this as an end user, when you go in, unless you're the very first person buying tickets for that movie, there, is, there will be some seats already sold. And so for that reason, for the sake of a demo, it's helpful to start out with some of those seats filled or not filled. And we'll see how much time we have tonight, because normally this is a three-day project, but because we're crunching and taking tomorrow off, um, I will see if we get to the point where we can randomly generate whether or not the seats are filled or not. But let's see how the cookie crumbles tonight. Right. I, I just have a quick question about the uh, the inner, that inner HTML sure. that towards the end of uh, script. Um, I'm pretty much assuming this, but I just want to make sure. So like when you say dot inner HTML and you set it to equal, the generated HTML is the HTML that we generated. Now, technically when the page loads, that inner HTML consists of those default seats in there, right? Correct. So when you set dot inner HTML to equal that, does it basically mean it clears out whatever was in that ID and then it just replaces it completely with what you put in? It does. So there's never like a conflict between like what was existing there before. Okay. No. In fact, if we wanted our HTML to get added on to whatever the existing HTML was, we could actually use a plus equals. And that would make it so we have our original seats in here. And when we click on the Godfather, we add in additional seats. Now that, I have that's what that's what I was thinking like might happen, but you just, I just, you just confirm that it wipes. When you set it to equal, it clears it out completely unless you put plus equals. You got it. And that will bring us back to clearing it out. So will enter HTML always override gener generated HTML? Or is Not always, a but depending on how you set your generated HTML into your inner HTML, yes, it will override it. Gotcha. So enter takes precedence over generated, depending. Yeah, it just depends. Oh, right here, we're saying, forget whatever is in the inner HTML. The inner HTML is now going to equal whatever we generate here. 
right? The right side of the equal will always overwrite whatever the left side of the equal is. Heard. Okay. So I think we should start exactly where Karen asked her question. She said, in here, I see my seats and I click on a seat, nothing happens. Okay, well, let's fix that. We know we've got access to our class material symbols. And let me just check something really quickly before I get too far. Max Alba has a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Do a live share. Oh, uh, yep. Actually, before I do a live share, um, for the sake of uh, keeping our code separate so we can keep track of the progress we're making, I'm going to right click. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to Finder. I'm going to go to my desktop and my my code. I'm going to go to my, nope, that's C3. I'm going to go to my C4, my code, my week nine. I'm going to duplicate my day one as day two. I will also drop a zip of this into the live stream channel. If you would like to start with my code instead of your own code, you are welcome to start with mine. Um, make sure that's sent. It did. I am then going to open my day two folder in VS Code, and I am going to start a live share with you guys, and I will also paste that into Slack. And I will give you guys a minute to get all of that set up. In summary, all we did was we duplicated our day one folder into day two, or you downloaded the zip from Slack and uh, copy that into your my code folder. Okay, so we are going to open up our index. We're going to open up our script. I'm actually going to move my script to the right half of the screen and my index to the left. Maybe. No, it's going to fight me. That's cool. There we go. Okay, so we're looking at our span here and we're saying, okay, well, we can add an on click to this, right? We can say down in our generated HTML in the second one, because if the seat is already occupied, we don't want to let them click on it. But if the seat is not occupied, that's our else case here, we can add an on click event that says something like seat clicked and it gives us access to the event. So I save that. I come over to my browser. I click on a seat. Oops, let me go live on that. I go to The Godfather first because that's the first movie we generated. I click on a seat and nothing happens. But if I pop open my console, I can see seat clicked is not defined. What is the computer trying to tell us? We don't have it. Sorry, I got one person go. Snyder, what did you say? I said we didn't have an ID defined. Could be wrong. I don't know. We don't need an ID defined on that because we have our on click specified directly on the span. What else is the computer trying to tell us when it says C clicked is not defined? We don't have a function or something for it to refer to when it looks for C clicked. Bingo. It's like C clicked. What do you mean C clicked? So what we need to do is go down to the bottom of our code and say const seat clicked equals the event. And we're going to just console log out seat was clicked. So I come over here. I still have to set my movie 
if I don't set my movie first, none of it will work. Then I get I get my seat showing up, and if I click on a seat, I get seat was clicked. So I'm just going to stop there for anyone who's following along. We did two changes. In the else case, we added our on click here, and then we also made a function to keep track of the seat clicked. And our end result should be after we select a movie and click on a seat, we are able to see seat was clicked. We have any questions on how we did that, how all this flow is happening? We just go through it again. Yes. Sure. So all we did is we said, hey, if the seat is occupied, we don't need to worry about whether or not the seat was clicked on or not. But if the seat is not occupied, add this thing called on click we are going to say go run the function called seat click and give us the details of the event we then come down here we add a we create a new const called seat click um seat clicked and we use the arrow function to create a new function where we just console log out that the seat was clicked hmm. yeah okay Okay, so now that we've got the seat clicked happening, what do we need to do next? We know the end goal is to make the seat turn blue if it is clicked on. So what do we need to do next now that we have access to some JavaScript when the seat is clicked on? Dot seat clicked in the CSS. So we will need that in the CSS. So we will say, uh, let's open our CSS and say, if the seat is selected, then the color will turn blue. Okay. What else do we need to do? What do we need to do in this JavaScript to make that turn blue? Maybe add a class. Where do we add the class? In the HTML. Well, if we add it in the HTML, it's going to get overwritten when we generate out the seats for a new movie. So knowing that, where would we have to put whether or not the seat was occupied or not, or selected or not? Oh, in the object, uh, in the seat object, seats. Yes. Object. So up here, we need to not only keep track if the seat is occupied or not, we also need to keep track of whether the seat is selected or not. So let's just say our second seat, we're trying to set as selected. Well, now when we come down and take a look at our document get element by ID movie selector, we're only handling if it is occupied. So what we need to do is add an else if the seat is selected, then we are still going to generate out some HTML, but instead of adding occupied, we're going to add selected. So we come over here, I click on the Godfather, and now my seat is blue. Well, why is it blue? Because 
my selected got set as true. I'm going to stop there. You should have a blue seat in your browser. That's what we're going for in the poll. Or making sure you understand how the seat is blue in the browser. We added yeah. selected true to our object. We modified out our movie selector on change to check to see if the seat was selected. If the seat was selected, then we add a class of selected on it. And then we modify our style.css to have a selected that sets the color to blue. Okay, any questions on that before we keep going? Anyone need more time? I, I need more time. Okay. Because one more minute and then we got to keep going only because we got a lot of ground to cover with taking tonight, uh, tomorrow night off. All you did was add the else if. Was that was a little, a little more than that. Oh, but were you, were you asking if he only, if he just added the else if? Besides the CSS, the only thing we did was add the else if statement. In the on change function, they, that's the only change he made. Yeah. Uh, yes. In the seat selected equals true, we added this else if statement in addition to the if and the else that were already in there. Then we also went up here and added in a selected true to the seats array so that one seat could turn up as blue. And then when we added this class down here called selected, we have to tell our CSS what selected looks like. So in our style.css, we added selected color blue. Okay. So now that we've got our selected seat showing up, I come over here. I see one of my seats was selected because we hard-coded that selected to true. But if I click on one of my seats, it doesn't turn blue. It just says seat was clicked. Well, we can go down to our function where the seat was clicked. But how do I get the seat to update up here to show that it was selected true? What's the piece of information I need in the seat clicked to know whether or not, whether what, so that I know, oh my God, Max, what piece of information do I need to know down here in order to set the seat as clicked? Add the generated HTML. Well, we will. But before we do oh. that, I need to set selected to true. 
how do I know which one to set selected to true? I use looking for the on click event. Well, I've got the on click event already down here, which is linked through the on click here. And I could console log out my event.target, right? Because we know that's what was clicked on. And if I go and I click on a seat, I get this span tag and it says it's a chair. Like, I know it's a chair. I need to know which chair it was clicked. In order to do that, we need to give our HTML some more information so that when the seat is clicked on, I'm able to retrieve out not only the row that was clicked on, but also the index that was clicked on. In order to pull that out off, what we're actually going to end up doing is using something called the data tag. So in addition to my on click, because this line is getting so long, I'm going to start to move this onto multiple lines in here. But my JavaScript does not like multiple lines as a string. So instead of using a single quote, instead I'm going to use a backtick. A backtick is right underneath the escape key, right above the tab key on your keyboard. It is uh, right next to the tilde key, if you have ever uh, typed in Spanish or any other languages that uses the tilde. So the backtick is similar to the quote in JavaScript except that it allows us to unlock a couple more advanced features. One of those features is multiple line strings, and that's why we're using it here. So in my span, I've got my on click and my class already, but we're going to add two new properties. We're going to add a data row index, and that row index is going to be equal to something. We are also going to add a, a data call index, and that is going to be equal to something as well. Okay, got our column set up, our row set up, but where do we get access to that data? Where do we get the row and the column from? Well, if I go up, my for loop should be keeping track of what row I'm on and what, what seat number I'm on but I don't actually have access to that. I only have access to the seat and the row itself. I don't have access to the index of the row. In order to do that, we need to use a new property. So on my selected movie seats, I'm going to say dot entries. That entries is a function that is built into an array that gives me access to not only the row index, but the row itself. And in order to prove that, I'm going to add a console log row index in here. So I come over here, I pick the godfather, and now when I scroll up, I get zero and one. Both of those are coming from line 37. Why are they coming from row 37? Because my row 37 right here is looping over each of the rows, but because we're zero indexed, we get zero first and one second. We also not only need access to the row index, we also need access to the column index as well. So we're going to say dot entries here. We're going to spell entries right. Then I'm not only going to get access to the column index, I still get access to the seat itself. That doesn't change anything yet, but what I need to do is include this row index and this column index in the seat information itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, has anyone heard the term template literal? 
going back to free code camp, depending on how much homework you've gotten done, what we are able to do is put a dollar sign and curly braces in there. We are only able to use those dollar sign curly braces because we put these back ticks here. Remember that I said back ticks give you some uh, special features. Not only does it allow us to generate out multi-line HTML, it also allows us to drop a value directly in to our HTML. So in here, I can say row index and also say call index. Don't worry, I'm coming up in a break on one second. So far, we have used, we modified our for loop to use dot entries here and here. The dot entries allowed us to get access to the row index and the column index. We then added two new properties to our span tag, one called data row index, another one called call index. And we were able to use the row index and the column index coming from our for loops and dropping them in to our HTML. And these dollar sign curly braces are saying, hey, take whatever the value of call index is and replace it right in here. Okay, that was a ton of code, but the payoff on all of that is when we're in our browser, if I refresh, I go to the Godfather and I go to my uh, element selector over here and click on one of these shares, I am able to see where go. Go index, call index. <laughs> well, that's not right. I should have been able to see, there it is. Maybe I didn't refresh. I'm able to see all of my seats. Data row index is equal to one. Why is it equal to run? One, because it's not in the zero index of rows. It's in the first index, right? That second row. Then I've got my call index, that's seat zero. So if I, sc if I scroll all the way down, and hover over my one four, I'm able to see that's actually my fifth seat. Because we start at zero and we go zero, one, two, three, four. So I'm going to pause here. What you should have done is your dot entries in both of our for loops. You should have modified your row and your seat to include both the row index and the column index. You should have modified your generate HTML to use a back tick and to add in these two lines of code, which are including the index information in the span tag that we are generating. And finally, you should be able to go over to your browser, refresh, pick the godfather, go to this tool in your elements, pick a chair, and see the row index and the column index for any seat that is not selected or occupied. And started a poll on that to see where you guys are at. That was a ton of steps. I'm going to be disappointed if one of you does not have a question at this point. Yeah, actually, a ton. The selected tool? What's that? When you go into the screen, yep. you have the chairs, and you're trying to select the chairs. Is there something specific you need to do? Um, no. The only thing is when you pick a chair that is not selected, any black, any black chair, you should be able to see the row index and the column index on it. So the point of all of that was so that in our inspe or in, um, inspection, we we're supposed to see the row the citizen. 
the row and the column that the seat is in. Yes. Okay. It, more specifically, it seems like now we can like target like specific things. If you have an index, you can say exactly where something is in a grid. Okay. Yes. So we haven't nice. gotten to why this is helpful yet. We just got to the HTML knowing where the seat is stored in the array. That was going to be my next question. Why did we have to do all of that? But yeah, I'll see. Next step will be apparent. Yes. Brian, go ahead. Uh, so the the weird stuff you did with the uh, with the const by putting them in brackets. Now, I remember from free cold camp that like there's something to that. It's not destructuring. I know it kind of looks like destructuring, but could you elaborate on like what the significance of like putting the variables and brackets like you did with row index and row and column index and seat. So it is exactly destructuring. That is exactly what is happening there. So the selected seats dot entries, if we copy that and just console log it out. Um, Um, if we look at what gets console log there, and this is more in a, of an advanced concept. So um, if this goes over your head, that's okay. Um, for uh, line 34, 36 that we just added that, here's our line 36. Oh, that did not show what I wanted it to show. Um, basically, what it's returning is an array iterator. So basically what happens is that the dot entries returns two pieces of information. So we can't really put that in one thing. We need to be able to get two pieces of information out. Because it's two pieces of information, we use this array symbol. And then we destructure the array iterator to get access to the individual row index and row coming out of the dot entries. That was quite literal in the name, huh? You're literally like taking it apart in order to pull information? Yes, that is exactly what we're doing. This, without the brackets, just gives you this iterator that's almost impossible to work with. Right. But what we're able to do is destructure the iterator into two separate structuring pieces, one of which is the index and the other of which is the row. Okay. And so that, that means that the order of those variables matters? Correct. And these variables can be called anything, but the order is what matters. Got it. That explains it for me. Thank you. The other way of understanding array destructuring is um, if we say something like const my array equals like one, two, three, and we wanted to say uh, const um, first num second num is equal to my ARR, if we console log out the second num, we should get two coming out. And that's because the array is set in here. Then we take my ARR and we destructure it on top of anything that's over here. So one becomes first num and two becomes second num. And that's how we get access to the second num here. Now that may look kind of dumb to do it that way. It's more common to destructure with an object. So say const my object is like key one, is apple and key two oops, key two is orange and then you say something like const um key one is equal to my obj and you can console log out your key one and that gets you your apple so destructuring is basically saying take whatever the object is, go find key one and take the value of that and store it into key one. So that's what comes out here. So these are two examples of destructuring, um, but that is a much more advanced JavaScript concept and one that we probably won't use um, the rest of the, the cohort. Um, it's more used um, in, in advanced JavaScript when you're dealing with lots of objects.
it kind of i mean i'm sure they're not the same but in my head i just remember how you can like put a bracket and you can pull whatever information from that array you know what i mean yes yeah. similar concept That's where yeah okay anyone need anything reviewed before we keep going here oh yes please what part um my browser is not showing anything other than a file. Why would that be? Your what is not showing anything? My browser, it only shows a- Share your screen, let's take a look. Yeah, so, browser. That's what I'm getting. You're not sharing your screen. <laughs> All right, up there. Uh, are you seeing my screen now? Yes, but just your desktop. Yeah, so you're not seeing my browser? No. Hmm. Okay. Probably share desktop two instead of desktop one. Yeah, I may have, that's true. Um, now I have two. Can you close this for me and to let somebody else go for a minute? Yep. Thank you. Any other questions here or any other pieces to review before we move forward? Yeah, so I'm playing with it in the console log, I mean, the inspection tool. And um, so the, I click on the black chairs and I get an output. So why is like, what's happening there? Like it counts one, two, three, six, I just don't really understand what's happening. So whatever chair we click on is going to show us the um, row index and the column index as mm -hmm. long as the seat is not occupied. So if we click on uh, like this chair, right, which is in the zero index row and in the seven sure index the of the column. Oh, see, this is why we have TAs, because someone needs to call me out for not sharing my screen. Okay. Um, if we are in our our first row and our eighth seat, we subtract one from both of them, right? So our zero index and our seventh seat. Um, if we click on that, what we get was not only seat was clicked, we see the row index is zero and the call index is seven. That's what we're going to tap into in a second. All we had to do was use the entries so we could get access to the index both here and in our column for loop. Then we stored that information inside of our HTML. Also, when we console log out the event.target, we are able to see that information on our JavaScript. With that said, we are, Schneider, was that enough of a review? to oh, yeah, answer yeah, yeah. your very just... first question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So with all of that said, we are now able to modify our data in here to get which seat was clicked. So we can say const row index is equal to our event.target, which we've used before. And now we are going to get a new attribute What's that attribute? That attribute is coming from our HTML. Remember, any piece of data that we add with an equal on our HTML is called an attribute. And that the attribute we want to get is our data row index. We also want to get our console, uh, I'm sorry, our const call index is equal to our event dot target dot get attribute 
data dash call index. And then we want to console dot log our row index and our call index. Okay. So if I come over here, so I have to select my movie. I'm going to pick this seat in particular. And what did I get out? One comma three. That was my first row index, my second row, and my third seat index, which means my fourth seat. Okay. That's cool. But what do we want to do? We want to use those indexes to update whatever movie was selected and update the seat to selected true. The problem is we don't know what movie was selected because in seat clicked, the way we got access to the selected movie was through this event. This event only exists in this function. So we need to modify our scope here. The selected seats that we're keeping track of, we are actually going to move out into here. And we're going to say, let selected movie seats. Wait, wait, wait. That means. Question. Um, yep. It's still inside the function, right? Nope. Outside yeah. the function. Because the function starts uh, here. Okay. Oh, okay. Now we come down to our seat clicked and we say, get the selected movie seats, use the row index. Whoa, where's row index coming from? It's coming from the event target that we clicked on using the data row index. Where's the data row index coming from? That's coming from our generated HTML. Where's the row index from here coming from? That's coming from our for loop all the way up here. Where's our for loop running from? Our selected movie seats. Where's our selected movie seats running from? That's running off of here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can not only use our row index, we can actually use our column index. And then we can set that individual seat to selected true. And if all of this works, we can console log out our selected movie seats and see if all of this is working. Don't worry, we're coming to a, a stopping point in one second. So I still have to select my movie first. I still can click on a seat. And it didn't turn blue. But if I open my array, and I know I clicked on in the second row of seats, now I can see my selected is true. Well, we did all that work. It's updating the right thing. If I click on the second seat, I can go into that array and see now the first and second seat are selected. But why did it not turn blue? Does the page need to reload to see that? If we move to something else and come back to it, now they're blue, but I don't want to have to do that every time. So what can we do so that when I click on the seats, they actually turn blue? Because we're updating it in our JavaScript data, where are we not updating it? CSS. No. Yes, but in order to update it in our CSS, what do we have to do? Update the DOM. To update the DOM, how do we update the DOM? 
Enter. Enter HTML. Wait a second. We use inner HTML up here. Right, but isn't that inside? Our on change all the way up here. Man, wouldn't it be helpful if we could take this entire block of code and be able to run it in two places? Yeah. What concept do we need to use in programming in JavaScript to be able to run the same block of code in two different places? Make it a function. You can make it a function. Oh, man. So we're going to make a new function called update HTML. And what H update HTML is going to do is it's going to, based off of whatever movie seats are selected, generate out all of this HTML and update the HTML. Oh, dear God, I just took a whole section of code and I'm moving it into my update HTML. My update HTML is starting with the generated HTML and going all the way down to my document get element seats in our HTML. That means that in my movie selector on change, I can now tell it to just update my HTML. That also means that in when my seat is clicked on, once I'm done updating it to selected, I can again tell it to update my HTML. So I come over here, I select my first movie, I click on a seat, oh my God, it turned blue. And I come over here and I click on another seat and that turns blue. That's it. Only took a couple lines of code to make our seats turn blue when we clicked on them. I don't know what's so complicated for you guys. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a minute. I'm going to give everyone a couple minutes to catch up here. I'm going to shut up so you guys can formulate any questions. And then I will do a complete run through of everything that we just did there. Well, Max, while people are looking at that, can I share my screen with you again, please? Go for it. Thanks, because at this point, I'm pretty behind because I've still been trying to be able to fix this. So go to your VS code. And I need to be able to see your files. Let me just uh, request a remote. A, a reminder, a much better way of getting your window to be full screen because you have this snapping tool installed up here at the top. You can just grab the window. Maybe you can just why And flick it up to the top and it will automatically size to full screen for you. So even if you size this all the way down, you can grab it and hold it up at the top of the screen and it will go to full screen for you. Um, yep. Okay. Okay. So now the problem is you've got a movies JS folder and inside your movies JS folder you have index script and style. Did you mean for movies JS to be a folder? Mm, yes. Okay. So if you did, then inside of your VS code, you need to open that folder called movies.js. Whatever index.html is in, that's the folder that needs to be opened in your VS code. 
So if we open that now, when we go live, it will take you right to your index page. So I had that accidentally open its file. You had you had movies JS. You had week nine day two folder open, not the movies.js folder open. Mm, okay. Right. Whatever your um, index.html, whatever folder that is in, that's what folder you need to open in VS Code so it knows where to go live. Mm -hmm. Okay. Brandon, go ahead. Um, so I'm getting a, another error in my in my browser console, but I can't find exactly what. Share screen. Let's take a look. Um, okay. Still... Not read properties of undefined reading one on your seat clicked. Okay. Uh, so let's switch over to your code. Um, can you stop your share and share either all of desktop one or two, just so we can switch between the two windows? Oh, sorry. Um... Is that better? Yeah, perfect. Okay, and let me take remote control if you don't mind. So you've got your seat clicked on line 70. So what we're going to do, just make sure... I feel like I missed something somewhere. But yep, I'm not we sure did why. a lot there. Okay, so what we did in here is we took our um, selected movie seats and we moved that. Uh, well, we actually did two things and your screen share is lagging a little bit on me. Your selected movie seats, you did move out here, but we've got to remove the const here. So it knows that this selected movie seats is part of this selected movie seats. So I'm going to save that. Now, when I select my movie and pick on a chair, um, it is probably doing the right thing. Notice we didn't get an error over here anymore. Yeah. Um, so it's probably doing this, and then it's going to update the HTML, but the update HTML is empty because the last thing we need to do is take all of this and move it Come on, you can do it, screen share. Move it. There we go. Nope. Too many lines. Hold on. Let me go back. Sorry, I don't want to lose any of your code. Cut and paste it into our update HTML. And then in our on change, we also need to call our update HTML so we can do that in both places. So I come over here. Green chair, killing me. Okay, we select our movie. We click on a seat. There it and is. it turns blue. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Good work there. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, we got three more minutes for questions here. Before we take our break and then we will go over a review of all the new steps that we did. We won't go all the way back to the beginning, but we're going to go back to what updates we made and the flow of what happens when a user clicks on something. And just another quick question. What was the purpose of the back tick again? The backtick allows us to do two things. The backtick is called a template literal. The template literal allows us to, one, use multi-line strings um, so that we can have line breaks in our string. The second thing it allows us to do is that dollar sign curly, bra curly bracket or brace syntax. 
that basically says instead of having to concatenate in the row index, we're able to say take anything between those dollar sign curly braces and drop that value in. So basically what it's doing is instead of having to close the back tick, do a plus, say row index, do another plus, add another new back tick and resume the string. What we're able to do is just do those dollar sign curly braces and say drop the row index right in here for us. Okay, thank you. So it pulls um, row index and that's already defined and then places that in there? Correct. Which uh, is why when you look at the inspect, we're able to see the output of that. Gotcha. That makes sense. So a, a template literal is just a less messy syntax for concatenating strings with an actual variable var value. So like, I'm guessing people use it in refactoring to make clean code look cleaner? For sure. Yeah. Okay. It is almost seven o'clock. Let's take a break. I will see you back at 725. Everyone. Everyone had a nice break. Enjoy it. It will be the last mid-class break you get until Monday. Okay. Reminder to everyone, we are off tomorrow and Thursday by popular vote. Um, I know Doug mentioned at the beginning of the call that he'll be around for one-on-ones tomorrow. Um, I will also probably not be far from my computer, um, not only tomorrow, uh, but also Thursday and also on Friday. So um, I can't guarantee any availability times, but as always, you can shoot me a Slack message. Normally, I can just jump in a Zoom call, and if I can't, I'll, I can give you a time, uh, and we can work it out from there. So um, as you're working, if you are still working on your free code camp, that is great. If you are working on your capstone and you need some input there of, of getting that started, um, I know HTML and, and JavaScript, uh, HTML and CSS might be a little rusty for you guys of building a complete website. That is what we are working our way up to. Um, and as always, if you have any questions about anything we've done in class, anything in free code camp, or, or anything related to our curriculum in any way, you are always welcome to schedule one-on-one. -on -one. So those one-on-ones uh, do not have to be super structured. They do not need to be about anything in particular. If you have questions about anything related to programming, that's what those one-on-ones are there for you uh, to utilize. So make sure you're uh, hitting them up. Our Calendly links are all in Canvas. Um, and so that's the best way to schedule, or you can reach out to us on Slack and we can go from there. With all of that said, let's do a very brief review on what we changed. So before, when we came into class tonight, we had all of this code in our on change. But what we realized was, hey, there are actually multiple things that can make our HTML need to update. When we change the movie, we need to update the HTML. But whenever a seat is clicked on, we need to update our data in our array and then also update the HTML. So right before the break, we took the vast majority of the code that was in our on change and we moved it into this new function up here called update HTML. Update HTML still grabs our generated HTML, starts that out as empty. It goes through each row and each seat, still does our if statement, and then uh, based off of the data in the seat, generates out our span tag, adds in our closing div for each row, then takes our generated HTML and sets it into the seats array. By moving it into this update HTML function, we are able to run all of this code now in two places. Once on our movie selector on change, and also when a seat gets clicked on. Basically, whenever we update the data 
of our of our seeps, we're able to call update HTML, and our update HTML is going to generate out all of the span tags that it needs to for each seat and each div for each row, then update that using our DOM in our HTML. Now, inside of that function, we made a couple of changes. We added this else if seat.selected true because we need to handle if the seat is selected at a class called selected so that in our style.css, we can see this, the selected color as blue. The other thing we did is we changed this to a template literal. A template literal means we're using backticks, which is the key under escape, instead of the single quotes or the double quotes. From there, we added in this thing called data row index because we needed to know what seat was getting clicked on. And instead of using concatenation, instead of saying something like this, That's kind of ugly, right? That's saying, hey, put the data call index in, then stop, drop whatever the value of call index is in, and then keep going on our, our string. That's a little messy. So instead, because we're using the back ticks up here, we can treat this like a string template. We can basically say data row index is going to go in. And then when we hit these dollar sign curly braces, take whatever is inside them, that's going to be this row index, and drop it into our string right here. So this code and this code are doing the exact same thing, ones with row and ones with call, except this is using that template literal syntax. <laughs> syntax, excuse me. So, um, this is just a cleaner way of doing it. However, this code is also completely acceptable. I'm actually going to leave both of these in here so you can understand that they both achieve the same goal there. We also needed to get access to row index and call index. The problem was we were looping over the row, which only gave us the access to the individual seat. So instead, we were able to use this dot entries and add in this call index here. And because the dot entries was giving us access not only to the seat, but also the index, we had to put these in brackets here. Once we got that call index, we were able to use it down here. That call index is now flowing all the way down to our event target get attribute, where we are able to update the correct information in our update HTML. I'm going to try and go through a complete user flow here, and I am going to need to just zoom out a little bit so I can fit the majority of the code on the screen. I know that's super tiny. Let me see if there's a better way for me to do this. Um, can I take this whole thing and put it in a scratch pad and see if we can accomplish this with two columns instead? Okay, so we are going to start with our on change. We say, hey, when this movie selector selects a movie, when they select the Godfather, the Godfather takes this movie selector on change, takes the Godfather, and puts that into our event target value. Our event target value then goes to the movie data array and goes up to the godfather right here and goes into the seats from right here and drops that into our seats here. That means our selected movie seats are now not only stored right here, but because they are defined up here, they are accessible in other places as well, in other functions. Then we call this function update HTML. 
update HTML is going to go all the way up to the function up here and say, hey, update HTML is here. We're going to start our generated HTML out as empty, and we're going to go over the selected movie seats. The selected movie seats are this giant array right here. The entire selected movie seats get dropped in to that. We then say, go over the first row of the movie seats. That's going to be the first row and generate out a new div. So our row index is going to be zero and our row is going to include all of these seats. Then go over each one of the seats inside of the row and also keep track of the index of the seat. So as we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 seats across, row index is going or call index is going to update every time we go across a seat. Then we need to look inside the seat. The seat is coming from this object right here. So it's saying, OK, is the seat occupied? This seat is occupied. Occupied is true. So the span that we generate out not only shows the chair, it also adds the class called occupied. From there, we go on to the next uh, seat because it's not selected or it's not else because our first if was true. So from there, we go back up and we get the next seat. This seat is not occupied, so we ignore this else, uh, this if statement, but it is selected. So we then go into here and we add the selected class instead of the occupied class up here. We keep on going for all of those seats, and I'm going to go ahead and clear this out so it doesn't get too, too crazy, um, until we hit a seat that is not occupied and is not selected. When it is not occupied and not selected, we add on this on click seat clicked. That doesn't run yet until we actually click on the seat. From there, we also add two additional properties or attributes or attributes, one data row index and the other data call index. That is coming from our call index right here from our for loop. And our row index is coming from right up here from our outer for loop. Remember, in order to go over each of the seats, we need to first go over each of the rows. And then once we're going over the row, we can get access to the individual seat. OK, from here, we are storing this data inside of our HTML. So when we go to our inspect element, we're actually able to see the data row index and call index get set into our HTML. Now, this update HTML method is done running once it takes all the generated HTML that we add in for every seat, depending on how it's selected, we take all of that generated HTML and dump that in to our inner HTML into our seats. Our seats get element by ID comes over here and dumps all of that information in. From our seats, it's done. It says, all right, I'm, I'm waiting for something else to happen. If you do your on change again, and you change to a different movie, I am going to run get element by ID movie selector on change again, and I'll go run through based off of whatever seat gets selected and generate it out from there. However, if a seat gets clicked, this on click event is going to run. This on click is going to say, well, I need to know what seat got clicked. So I'm going to take my event target, that's the thing that got clicked on, and get an attribute out called data row index. Wait a second, we've seen row index before. Row index is flowing from our get attribute up to our HTML from our HTML we generate. That row index is coming all the way back up from our for loop up here. And our call index is coming from our other for loop right here. So basically, we're trying to say whenever we generate out a seat that can get clicked on, also store the information about the index. Because when we go 
and that of uh, that seat is clicked on, we can get the call and row index back out to use that information in our row index and call index from right here in order to set the correct seat as selected. However, when we update our movie data over here and set whatever seat we click on as selected true, that only updates in our JavaScript data. That does not update our HTML. So we need to go to this update HTML method and go rerun through the object to generate out the HTML again and set that into our inner HTML, effectively refreshing or updating the data that is reflected in our browser. Okay, a lot of code there. Talk to me how we feeling. Are there any sections we want to go over before we do anything additional? We want to make sure that we're understanding uh, what we have so far. Is there anything that you guys are like, all right, you said it, but I need to hear it again. So, so I want to make sure I understand that when we're talking about index, we're talking about where it is whether it's at the zero, one, two, or three index. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Okay. So index is saying, if we said uh, zero, zero, we're talking about this object. If we said zero, one, we're talking about this object. If we said one, zero, we're talking about this object. Because that whole so it's is itself a zero index and the second one is itself a one index. Correct. Okay. okay. Because we're dealing with two arrays, one array here, and then inside that one array, there is another array. That is what we call a multi-dimensional array. In mm -hmm. other words, we have an X and a Y coordinate or a row and a column coordinate in order to be able to access the data inside of it. Okay. See. Which is why it takes two indexes down here in order to get to the data that we want. Oh, okay. Hmm. All right, what else? Could you um, please describe again what? attribute is related to yeah this get attribute any time that we add a something equals onto our html this is called an attribute so class is an attribute on this span tag on click is an attribute on this span tag so whenever we want to get the value of an attribute here like row index or call index we can use the get attribute function just like we can use dot inner html or dot on change get attribute is a, a part of the document object model that allows us to retrieve data out of the target that got clicked on mm. yeah okay So nothing's occupied and nothing's selected. Then the generated HTML does what? I guess I don't understand what that else statement really means. It's saying if the seat is occupied based off of all of this data here, we're going to loop through it from this for loop. We're going to loop through each one of these arrays. Then from the inner for loop, we're going to get access to each one of these seats. Mm -hmm. From there, we're going to say, if the seat is occupied, well, based off of how the for loop is running, this is going to be our first seat. The first seat occupied is set to true. So mm -hmm. it's going to add the class called occupied into it. And based off of our CSS, 
we know that occupied seats show up as red. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to keep going and it's going to say the next seat, it is not occupied, so it ignores this if statement, but it is selected. Right. So because it is selected, we are going to add a class onto that called selected. And then that's going to turn blue. Red. Red. Ah, uh, blue, blue, blue. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, occupied is red. Selected is blue. Selected is blue. Occupied is red. Yeah. Okay. And then it's going to go through and say this seat is not occupied. So we ignore this if statement. It is not selected. So we ignore this if else if statement. And then we hit the else. And so we say we still put out a span that's still a chair, but we add in three pieces of information onto that span. We add the on click event so that when it's clicked on, we can handle the selecting of the chair. And then we need to know what chair, we need to know the positioning of that chair. So in order to do that, we add in two additional attributes, data row index and data call index. And that's what allows us to use our get attribute down here to know what chair was clicked on. But we're not doing anything with that chair. It's just. No, we are updating that chair in the selected movie seats to selected. And then we rerun update HTML, which is going to go through this code. And once it hits the chair that was clicked on, it is now no longer going to hit this else because selected is now equal to true. So it will now show that chair as blue. Right. I think I'm still confused as to what the else generated HTML is doing, or is it not really doing anything? It's outputting a black chair with the positioning information of the chair and an event to listen to when it is clicked on. Okay. Okay. Hey, Jennifer, I think like maybe another way to look at it is like, so you see those uh, materials that are on the left side of the screen, those, those spans that are over there. Okay. On the right side of the screen, those four loops, what they're doing is, is they're going over each of those seats in the array up top, and they're checking all of those conditions for each one. And based on what's, what that seat object looks like, it's making a, a version of one of those spans over here. Mm -hmm. Only it's making it based on the updated details of the seat, whereas these are like default spans. You know, the four loops on the on the right, they're looping over that and trying to make it like that description fit the actual seat. So if it's selected, they'll add a selected class to it. If it's occupied, they'll add an occupied class to it. You know, mm -hmm. so just think about it like those fours and those ifs. Think about like it's asking those questions every single time it encounters a seat. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can you can control like what it does, because every time it loops, the computer can do it so fast, almost it's almost like it doesn't seem like it's doing it, but every single time it hits a, a new seat, it's asking it all those questions that we have there. And based on how that seat is configured, it makes a span like it like on the right, on the left. Wow. That might not have helped, but like, you know, sometimes it's just uh that explanation would have helped me get it, you know. So and so this is evident when we go to our browser and we go to the Godfather. We see these seats here and we're like, okay, so what? But if you go poke in here, you can see our first chair is so is occupied. Mm -hmm. Well, where did that come from? That came from this first span tag because the first seat was occupied. Yeah. Okay, what about the second seat? Well, the second seat shows up as selected. Why does it show up as selected? Because that based off of selected true, the selected was true here. So this span tag got added, included, including the selected. Now we get to the next seat, which is not occupied or selected. 
That means what we see in our browser is not just the material C material symbols outlined chair. We see an on click, a row index, a call index, and then all of that chair information. Well, where's this zero and two coming from? Well, it's ignoring these two pieces of the if statement and going into the else. Well, why is this else different? Because we want to pay attention to whether the seat was clicked on because we they are allowed to select that one. But we also need the information about what seat they clicked on. So we include the row index and the call index, which is coming from the loops up at the top that are generating out all of the HTML for us. They're making sure an, a seat gets generated each time. Mm -hmm. Okay. That really made that work. Thank you, Brian, for the assist there. Yeah, gosh. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. It's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, there's no, there's no question. But again, like just think of the computer is so powerful that it can literally run those logic, like those if statements every single time it loops over. So like you, if since it's so powerful, you can make it do literally anything you want during a loop. Yeah. Wow. Was very helpful. <sighs> to exemplify the power of a for loop. We've actually set up our arrays here so far, but that's a lot of work, right? That's going to add a lot of data. And if we wanted to make this work for every single movie we have over here, we got a lot of work to do for all of that. Wouldn't it be nice if when the page loaded, it generated out all of these seats for us? and gives it a 50-50 chance of whether or not it's occupied or not. Obviously, in the real world, we wouldn't randomly be filling seats there, but we can get the computer to generate out this information for us. So that's what we're going to do next. We're actually going to delete out everything inside our seats array. Sometimes, in order to make a new feature, you've got to break it. And what we're going to do is we're going to load up. I'm actually going to get rid of half of my movies here just for the sake of time. And I'm going to add in my movies over here. And I'm just going to make the movie show up. So looking at this, I know I need to generate out the seats for every movie. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for const movie of movies. Actually, give me one second. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to console log out my movie and see what I get there. I might get something movie, movie data. Okay, so I get an error here that says movie data is not iterable. What does that mean? It can't be gone through over and over. Why not? It's not linked. That data at the top isn't linked to the functions below. Nope. Movie data is right here. They're both defined. Because it's an object. Bingo. We can't loop over objects like we can loop over arrays. However, what we can loop over is the values inside that array. I'm sorry, that object. Mm -hmm. So we're able to use object. This is like another reserved word built into JavaScript that has access to this function called values. And now when we loop over the individual movie, you can see price 8, 9, 10, and 11 come out. 
Now, what we lose access to there is the movie title, but we don't care because the whole point of this is to generate out the seats. Well, we can generate out the seats without knowing what movie it is. So we're able to write a for of loop here using this object.value syntax that gives us access to each individual movie. Because there were four movies here, that means that loop is running four times. And so I am able to get access to all four seats arrays in my console. Okay, now we want to think about, well, what do we need to generate? We know that we need to not only generate out each chair, but we need to generate out eight rows of the chairs because there are eight rows and eight columns of chairs. So instead of using a for of loop, because we don't have a predefined an array of, of what it's supposed to generate, we're going to use a old school for loop. We're going to say let num rows equal zero. And while num rows is less than eight, why less than eight? Because we're start at zero. Take num rows and add one to them. Matt, then, yes. Why'd you keep Citizen Kane and Godfather as strings, but not Saw Sink and Casablanca? Because these have a space in them, it added the quotes. Uh, prettier added the quotes. But uh, when I um, when I put the quotes on this, because quotes are not required as a object, when you're defining an object key. Quotes are not required unless there is a space in the key. And because of that, Prettier remove those spaces for me. Oh, OK. Um, OK, so now we're, we're going through this loop eight times. What we're going to do is say, hey, the row is going to be an empty array. And every time, oh, that's not what I meant. Let row equal an empty array. Just like our generated HTML here that we needed to start out as empty, we also need to start an empty array for each row. Then we're going to say for let num calls equal zero. Well, num calls is less than eight. Num calls plus plus. And what do we want to do for each column? Well, we want to go to this row and push. What does push do? It adds on to the end of the row, the end of the row. What do our seats look like? Well, they're all going to start off as selected false, right? When you go into the movie site, you shouldn't have any seat selected for you. But we're going to do something fancy here. We're going to say, they are occupied if math.random is less than 0.5. Whoa. Okay. What's that doing? Math.random always returns a number between 0 and 1. It is often a decimal number that's really long, 0.45637, whatever, right? What we're doing is we're saying generate a random number between zero and one. And if that number is less than 0.5, then this whole thing is going to be true. However, if it is greater than 0.5, then it is going to equal false. Then once we generate out each one of the seats, once we get all eight seats generated out, they are all going to be contained in our row. So we can go back to the movie. Oh, dear God, Max, where did you get movie from? Movie is coming from our outer for loop. We are now three for loops deep into this. We are saying, go through each movie, okay, Godfather, Shawshank, Casablanca, Citizen Kane. That's going to get us access to the seats. Inside those seats, we need to generate out eight rows. 
every row is going to have their own array. And every time that we need to add into that row, we need eight seats across. So we need another for loop in here to generate out each seat, which is going to be an object. Once we have that row, once we have all eight seats in that row, we need to grab our movie dot seats. That's coming from our movie up here. Our dot seats is up here. And what we're going to do is push in the row that we generated right here and push everything into. And once we're done looping through all of that movie data, we then save all of that into the movie seats. So I'm going to save on all of that. I'm going to come back over. I'm going to pick a movie. Notice I've only got my four movies here now. And when I pick a movie, boom. random seats. And if I come up here and I go back to Shawshank, I get not only do I get random seats, but if I go back to my first movie, which was Casablanca, you see those same seats are now selected or occupied. They're not selected, they're occupied. Mm -hmm. So a question for you guys, how many times does this line of code run? Seven? Nope. Nine? Nope. 49? Nope. The amount of rows and then the amount of seats? Nope. Once? Close. Once? The amount of rows, I'm sorry, the amount of rows, the amount of seats, and the amount of movies. Because we not only need to generate out every individual seat in every row, but we also have to generate out all of the seats for all of the movies. That means if all of this code is running, when we console log out our movie data, we find that even though we started with this nice lightweight object, what we ended up doing was generating out seats for all four movies. So when we go in and take a look, look at what our seats array looks like. Hmm. This contains all of our individual seats and whether or not they are occupied. That means if we go to Citizen Kane, which happens to be what I clicked into here, you actually can see, hey, occupied. All seven of the first seats are occupied. The last one is not. And look what's reflected in our HTML. Hey, Max, with the push thing, what are we removing from the array? We're not removing anything. Push adds on to the end of the array. Oh, OK. Is anyone brave enough to talk through our three nested for loops? Mm -mm. I'm going to stop here and poll because I'm curious to see how many of you I lost. I don't know. And if you need a couple minutes to catch up, now's the time to do it. I can try to give it a shot. Sure. So um, you're saying for the const of moving of the ob object values in the movie data. Let start with the number of rows at zero. And uh, if it's less than eight, 
which will be the eight seats. I mean, the eight rows. Eight rows going down. Yep. yep. And then the number of rows then add to the rows. Correct. So we're basically saying every time we finish with one row, add one more to the row. One count. row until you reach eight. So it has yes. to be eight. And then let the row be an empty array. Then you will go to the number of columns and start at zero. Go through the number of columns till uh, but less than eight. And then for each column that you go, add one until you reach that eight. Then push at the end of the row. If selected false, that it's selected false. So it's going to start at false because none of the seats are going to be there. Then you're going to go and occupy at math random to be less than half of it. So 0.5, pretty much half of the seats. You're going to yep. go randomly and pick only half of the seats to be selected. Yep. Then um, you're going to go to the movies seats and push the row into the row. Correct. We're going to take the row that we just generated and push that into the movie seats. The movie seats is already an empty array up here. So you're so what goes into that empty array to generate that array for those seats or that movie or that location. Correct. So what we're doing here, these curly braces are super important, right? Because this curly brace is saying we are done generating the seats for this row. This curly brace is saying we are done generating all the rows for this movie. And this curly brace is saying we are done generating all the seats for all the movies. Why are we saying, oh, go ahead, Brian. And I just wanted to, to double check since the seats is an existing array, right? Yes. And we're pushing rows into it, which ultimately ends up being an array. So is correct. it is it correct to assume that seats will be populated with as an array with arrays inside it? And we can confirm that because when we console log out our movie data and look in the browser at a particular movie, we see seats is an array of more arrays. And if we click into any one of those, we can say see each individual array. And if we click into one of those, we can see all of the objects inside that array. What this means is because no movie is selected up here, we probably shouldn't be showing any of these seats. We can actually get rid of all of our divs over here. Why? Because we are generating out all of our seats by using a for loop. Then once we generate out all of our seats and store it in the, in the object as an array of arrays, we are then able to use another double for loop to generate out each span tag based off the data stored in our seats. That means when we come over here, we can click our select drop down, click on a movie, and get out the seats that we want. And as always, if we click to another movie, we get different seat data and we can click back to that original and get that. In fact, we can get even cooler. We can choose two seats in Casablanca and say, no, let me go back over to Citizen Kane and I want these two seats instead. And then go, well, maybe not. Let me go back to Casablanca and look what's still there 
the seats we selected for that movie. Well, how is it that smart? It's still maintaining everything inside our movie data. Because we made our seat click based off of the selected movie seats that got updated any time that got updated any time our movie selector was changed right here. That means whenever we click on a seat, the selected movie seats is always going to be based off of the drop down so that the movie up here is going to get updated based off of what is in the drop down. All right. I know you've got questions. I know you don't know what your questions are, but I know you guys have questions. Have you so. may not know what your questions are. How is it still running our um, HTML divs again? How is it still doing what? Running our HTML, all those divs we deleted. Because we're calling update HTML um, on change of the dropdown. So what we're doing is we're saying, um, excuse me, what we're saying is movie selector on change, go update the HTML. Mm -hmm. Update HTML is saying, I don't care what's in the HTML right now. I'm starting out from scratch. And based off of the data in the selected movie seats, I'm generating out a div for each row and a span for each seat. And then once all of that HTML is generated, we are then going to set that in to our seats, which starts out over here as an empty div. So everything that we're generating in here is getting set into our HTML. That's pretty cool, it's pretty cool. But how does it know how many seats to add into it when a movie selected? Because up here, we're saying there should be eight rows and eight columns for every movie. Okay. So this is generating out our data the second the page loads. But we don't actually get to see any of that unless we open the console and look in the movie data. This movie data doesn't actually get used in our HTML until a movie is selected. And when the movie is selected, when it is changed, we take that movie, store it in the selected movie seats, then tell our HTML to update. Our HTML to update uses whatever movie is selected and gets out the row and the column of those seats, then generates out the span and div tags for each column and row then sets it in to our HTML. Does the push play a part in generating those? The push yeah. happens right here and right here. The push is what is generating out the seats, but it is not generating the HTML itself. If you okay. separate this out, this generates our arrays on the JS data side. This uses the already generated arrays and uh, to um, generate HTML that reflects the data in the arrays. I just questioned my sanity and didn't know if arrays were spelled IES, and it's not.
10 years as a professional software developer and I don't know how to spell the plural of array. Probably not a good sign. So separate this out, right? Everything that's happening up here is on the JavaScript data side. That's what's filling out our movie data based off of the loop running a bunch of times. If we wanted to, we could say, well, there are only three rows and there are only two columns. Well, that's going to look funky. But if we pick a movie, we were. I broke something. Script line 35. Now, if I pick a movie, I only get three rows and two columns of those seats. But my code still works. I can still click on a seat and have it turn red or turn it, have it turn blue. This is generating out the movie data. This is generating out our array of arrays, which is showing all of our seats inside of it. So if we go back here, we can adjust this back up. We could go bigger if we wanted to. We could say 10 rows and 25 columns. And this, if we look at our array, now we've got an, our seats have an array 10. That's our rows. And look at our seats inside of that. That means that we're about to get a really freaking big theater. I don't think it would be a fire hazard for anyone in this seat to actually be able to make it out or anything. Okay, so let's adjust that back down. We can really adjust this to whatever we want to adjust the number of rows and columns that show up. But this is all impacting our JavaScript data. This is using what got generated up here to convert that data into our div and span tags so our HTML knows what to show, and also storing the row index and column index inside our HTML so when the seat is clicked on, we're able to get that information back out of our HTML, update the data in our JavaScript object up here, then regenerate the HTML based off of what data changed in our JavaScript. How we feeling? Feeling like I need to study some more. Oh God, yes. I think I'm actually feeling better now than I did when we had the information in the arrays. Because I've kind of the concept of maths randoms more than going through the arrays and finding all the information yourself. Um, because we did the math randoms with the the um code camp mm -hmm. we're still generating the arrays right it's not like we got rid of the arrays we're just having the computer generate the array for us we just don't have all the information in front of us that we have to go through so it makes it a little bit more complicated going through that much information yes yeah. this is overwhelming and we're going to be doing tic-tac-toe next and we will be using a multi-dimensional array, but it will be a multi-dimensional array of nine things total, right? So it will be much easier. We're not dealing with eight rows and eight columns and 64 pieces of information. We're going to get started with just that three by three. Well, we're going to finish with that three by three. Um, so we're going to get a little bit more practice next week with tic-tac-toe as well. And then if there is time left, we're going to come back to the movie seat project and add in a couple little pieces like um, making it so if we click on a movie or if we click on two seats, it will show us down here at the bottom. You have two seats selected for a total of 22. And we'll add in this little alert that says, you know, hey, we would normally check out now and making the seats go to red next. So there's a little bit more work that we can do on this project, but your homework, which I have not posted yet and will by tomorrow, 
is going to be to go through all of this JavaScript and leave comments, inline comments, just in your JavaScript, you don't need to do anything else, talking through how this works. You have three options there. You can, the hardest is talking through it in the order that we built it, the order that we engineered it. The second is talking through it in the order that the computer runs it. And the third is talking through it top down. How do we understand this code? How do we start at the top, work our way down, and explain line by line what's happening? That's going to be your homework. So you're going to take this file. I'll have a link that you can download it from. You're going to open it in VS Code, and you're going to be using a lot of these inline comments and adding all of your own notes inside of it. The more thorough you are, the more that you can show that you understand this code, the better it is. We don't want the boilerplate, this is a for loop. Well, no shit, Sherlock. I know that it's a for loop. I don't need you to tell me it's a for loop. But I do need you to say this for loop runs over each object inside the movie data. That gives us access to the seats, which we update later in the array. That's the level of understanding that I want, but I want it in your words. I want to hear how you understand this is working. I'm going to call on Doug here because Doug has done this project. Doug has also worked with very complicated multidimensional arrays because Doug's capstone was building a map through a grocery store where everything needed to be coordinate-based. He needed to know what uh, what aisles, uh, not only what aisles objects were in, but how far down the aisle was that object. So Doug used a lot of multidimensional arrays to be able to plot out where all of the items were in the grocery store. So I'm going to throw it over to Doug to see if he had any insights when he completed this project uh, this time six months ago. Insights. I mean, <laughs> you really covered everything. Um, you know, arrays inside arrays. That's once once you wrap your head around it. And it, like Max said, it's it's you know it's like rows and columns. So it's like a coordinate system. You go how many across and how many down, and that gives you the ind indexes or the indices that you need to access to get that element. So like with the tic-tac-toe, you know, zero, zero is going to be your top left corner. Two, two is going to be your bottom left, your bottom right corner. Or like Battleship. Or like Battleship, exactly. Yeah, you could have uh, identify one array by, by letters. And then uh, inside each of those. Damn it, Brian, why did you have to say that? Now I'm going to go make battle Battleship this weekend and decide if that's going to be a better project for next week. I was saying it, I was like, I'm probably going to date myself, but... <laughs> <laughs> we should get a, a, an audio clip from, like, the original commercials. You sunk my Battleship! <laughs> that would be Nostalgia overload, that's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that that's extra. If you want to add sounds to your project, we get fancy with the graphics. That was a great game, wasn't it? Hey, Max. For my capstone yeah. project, I was thinking about having music play, and then the music turns off when you press play on the like the live stream. I feel like that would suck. <laughs> What's that? I feel like that would suck. I'm not sure though. Like well, some, pe some, some people some people have that. like so the browsers have ad added some updates to them that don't let you start playing audio just when the page first loads because they know how annoying that can be. Um however, as soon as the user interacts with the page by like clicking on anything or I think even scrolling on the page, the browser then lets autoplay audio kick in. Um, and so what 
a lot of people will end up doing is they'll put like an autoplay toggle in like the bottom right of the screen. And if you turn on autoplay or like background music or something like that, that user event, that clicking on it is enough to get the music to start playing. Um, and then you have access to that. That will be a lot easier in React once we get to it. Um, but it, it's totally feasible in, in, in order to pull that off. The, better, the bigger question is, is that MVP, right? Because a lot of the capstone is, what do I want to get practice out of? Um, and, and you can decide from there, hey, maybe it's not MVP, but audio is something that like I may want to use in other projects. Like, I don't know, hypothetically, if I wanted to become a game developer, audio is pretty important. So maybe that's something that you decide, no, it's not MVP, but it is something I want to invest into learning. Okay. All right, well, shoot, thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to switch over to terms for the last whole six minutes, five minutes of class, plus six minutes. Did you ever meet someone who can talk as much as I can? Uh, yeah, who can talk more than you can. Let me pull up outline. Because for some reason, I only have day one open. I'll put you up against one of my family members. Is the time of year. <laughs> yeah. All right. What terms did we learn tonight? Object dot values. A function built into JavaScript that allows us to iterate over the values of an object using a for of loop. Template literal. Template literal. A fancy version of a string that uses back ticks um, allows us to use multi-line strings and also the um, syntax to concaten concatenate a value in without having to interrupt the string and use plus. Get attribute. Get attribute. A JS DOM function that lets us retrieve information used in an HTML elements attributes. I want to say generated HTML. Pretty sure that was in last night's, um, but we'll just add it in. Uh, generated HTML, an empty string we create to store the HTML we eventually update in the DOM using inner HTML. Just to know, I might be speaking for other people, but I think you named like generated HTML so well that like it almost sounds like it's like a, a function of JavaScript. <laughs> I think it is not. I was for I well, was like, really. I I get, it was it was it's perfectly worded for what it is. Like you're we're generating HTML with that loop, but and I'm sure you've referenced it before. We could call it anything, but generated HTML really is just the best thing to call it. I would I would. So I, I appreciate you, you saying that because I, I want to just prove that point to a T here, because if you're like, oh, yeah, you, you, you know, you use a loop and you do generated HTML, people in the industry are going to be like, what do you mean generated HTML? So uh, to prove a point here, instead of calling it generated HTML, I'm going to call it pretty HTML unicorns and all of this code will work. Pretty HTML unicorn starts out as an empty string. Every time we get a new row, we add a div to our pretty HTML unicorns. 
From there, we add in a span based off of the data in the object. Then we close off our div tag that we opened for every row in our pretty HTML unicorns. And once we are done generating our pretty HTML unicorns, we set that back into our inner HTML into our seats. So if I save that, I go back to my browser and I look and refresh, you'll see that all of my pretty HTML unicorns still show up, right? So generated HTML, yes, we are still generating out the HTML. We're just storing it in a variable called pretty HTML unicorns in step. So yes, aptly named variables are important, but at the end of the day, they are just variable names. And as long as we use that variable name consistently, it's kind of like saying, I'm solving an equation, but it doesn't have X in it. It has Y in it. Okay, well, Y means the same thing in all the places. So it doesn't matter that you used Y instead of X. That's kind of the, the math answer to that. Brian Anything destructuring or oh. destructuring. Destructuring. Yeah. Pulling the array apart. An advanced I let me say a more advanced JavaScript concept that allows us to pull apart an array or object into pieces. Um similar to dot or bracket notation, um, commonly used in for loops to break apart iterators, iterators which um, are uh, used by functions like dot entries that return multiple uh, pieces of data. Ooh. Anything else for tonight that we want to capture? Push dot row. Uh, row dot push. Row, row but we're going to say dot row push. push. Um, a JS function built into all arrays that allow us to add a value onto the end of the array. Anything else for tonight? All right. Everyone have an excellent Thanksgiving. You will not visually be required to see me until Monday. You may hear from me. I will make a note when I get the homework up in Canvas, which again, will just be going through this code, making sure you understand it. And that level of understanding can come in multiple ways, right? So if you find that writing all of this down into index cards is going to help you, that's great. If you find going through and, and adding the comments to the line of code, that's great. If you think it is better to run through it in the order that we built it instead of the order that we wrote it, that is is fine. If you want to think about the computer and how all of that works, that is fine. If you want to send me a football diagram that I make in class of just circling the code and showing how all of the code is flowing, that is also fine. The easiest way is to go through and add those inline comments 
but this is your test of JavaScript. We're going to get a little bit more practice next with, week with either tic-tac-toe or if we're feeling ambitious battleship, I may have to play around with that idea. Um, but we're going to get one more week of JavaScript practice, but then the tough part really kicks in. Now you've got to use this to build projects using APIs, to build React, and to build backends. JavaScript does not go away. JavaScript is what our entire curriculum is built in. We now have laid the cornerstones, the foundations of our curriculum, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, starting uh, the week after next, we get into APIs, and this is not a new area. We are building on top of those foundations. So use your time off this week to get additional practice with JavaScript. Make sure your foundations are secure. Next week, we will be doing a little bit more practice. We'll be building one more project. We're going to make sure we really get that JavaScript in, and then we start building on top of it. So really keep that in your, in your head for what we're going into starting next week. I've said it once. I've said it a gazillion times. We call it a boot camp for a reason. It's intense. You got put through a workout tonight. Make sure that workout is sinking in. Make sure that you're getting everything for it. Because on Monday, we're hitting that workout again and going a little bit harder and doing a little bit harder of a project. All of that said, happy Thanksgiving. And I will see you guys on Monday. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye, all.